Greetings. Picked up a very interesting book uh, recently called One is Company. One's Company by Peter Fleming, a British writer who uh, spent some time in Manchuria, Manchu Fu, the puppet state, in 1933. And in fact, uh, has some very, I would say, compelling in a very subtle way, um, stories about um, these patrols that he's going on, these anti-bandit patrols uh, with uh, Japanese soldiers. So, uh, without further ado, chapter 18, Flying Column. M and I stood on the platform of Mukden Station. The scene, outwardly, was a gay one. The Japanese ladies, and these predominated, were wearing their best clothes. So were their children. Commemorative fans, specially manufactured for this occasion, fluttered ubiquitously. At the windows of the troop train, the soldiers lolled and were facetious. Another flying column was leaving Mukden on anti-bandit operations. It was a normal occurrence. There was nothing in the history of these recurrent expeditions to suggest that there would be a firm tone in either death or glory. I was rather surprised to see how tragically, behind their gaily agitated fans, the seers off were taking it. Behind me, a Japanese lady wept silently and with a touching dignity. All up and down the platform, there was a deeper undercurrent of emotion that then seemed to be warranted. A whistle went. M and I took our places. The train pulled out. I'll speed up a little bit here. All that we knew of the plan of the campaign was this. The worst bandit country in Manchuria was in the mountains east of Mukden. On this area, a, small, a number of small, swiftly moving units were about to converge. Each had as its first objective a village. Inside the area, on reaching which it would go into garrison for a time and carry out the intensive pacification measures in the district. The second stage of the campaign depended on developments and had not yet been formulated. Although he writes later, he writes about executions uh, that happened. He also shows these propaganda units um, that would come in and uh, play phonograph records uh, for Chinese children and basically tell them, you're a part of this new amazing Wang Dao, right? This new system, this uh, imperial system. The unit to which M and I were attached was a mixed force of Japanese and Manchukuo troops under the command of a Japanese major. The Japanese, who numbered about 175, were men of the Independent Railway Guard, which is a force roughly equivalent to a division with its headquarters at Mukden. Officially, as its name suggests, it does not count as part of the regular army. This was one of its most useful characteristics in the days when Japan's forces in Manchuria were limited by treaty. There were also about 400 Manchukuo troops controlled, though not nominally commanded, by a Japanese captain. We saw very little of these, for they marched always in the rear and accompanying and accompanied the column, I think, as much for training as for anything else. Now, our jumping off point was Fushun, for which the benefit of those who like to think in household words may be called the Sheffield of Manchuria. The men were detrained and marched off to barracks on the outskirts of the town. M and I and our interpreter were directed to a Japanese inn. Our interpreter was a private soldier called Takani. To those not familiar with the Japanese system of conscription, it may seem incongruous that a private soldier should also be a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This was the case with Takani. He came of a good middle-class family to return from America to take up an excellent engineering job in Tokyo, for which he was qualified by his foreign training. But he, like every other young man who has not been debarred from doing so by physical or moral disability, had to serve his two years in the army. He had been nine months in Manchuria, and he did not much care for it. He was a rather special case. He was 26 years old. Every recruit had to submit to the rigorous discipline, the monotony, and the minimum allowance of leave, which are the lot of the Japanese soldier. But most of them begin their term of service before the age of 20, and the two years involved are thus of no serious loss to their career. Takani, however, brought into barracks a mind to some extent emancipated from the simple, unquestioning traditions of his contemporaries. And moreover, the necessity of putting in his period of conscription, which had lost him a good job, hardly won. Besides which, he found that after his life abroad, he had little in common with the comparatively callow boys who were now his companions. So, although he made an admirable soldier, being quick-witted and handy, he was a little discontented. To us, he was invaluable. We were an odd trio. M was, and still is, as far as I know, a member of the House of Lords. He was 29 years old and tall for his age. He had some sort of journalistic pretext for his presence in Manchu Kuo, but it was a thin one, for during a prolonged stay in the Far East, he was never known to put pen to paper. 
Really, it was the hope of adventure that had brought him. As a companion, he had numerous advantages besides his native charm. Among them, a capacity for enduring discomfort without complaint, an inexhaustible fund of conversation on a variety of topics, and a courtesy toward the Japanese, which was more flowery and more appropriate than anything which I, a rather boorish individual, could hope to sustain for long. Also, he was well equipped. How well equipped, I only realized when we made an inventory of our belongings at the inn at Fushun. I had interpreted literally our instructions to pack light. By putting into a rucksack, a shirt, shorts, two pairs of socks, a bottle of whiskey, Boswell's Life of Johnson, and half a pound of cheese, the sole indomitable survivor of my trans-Siberian victuals. This, with blanket, camera, films, field glasses, and water bottle, made a load which, in case of necessity, could be carried on foot. M was far better provided. A large suitcase and a haversack were found to contain, amongst other things, 23 different sorts of medicine, the concise Oxford Dictionary, a prismatic compass, a solar topee, eight pencils, a ground sheet, pajamas, a pair of goggles, a cummerbund, and a slide rule. M was armored against almost every contingency, from leprosy to long division. We had been issued by the Japanese Consulate General with automatic pistols, but these we had left behind. Partly on the principle that it never rains if you wear a Macintosh, and partly because these weapons are, except as local color, more trouble than they are worth to those not expert in their use.